If I had to live in the woods and I could only bring five items, a cast iron pan is certainly coming with me. Not only is this thing super durable, but it's so versatile. Yet when people think of cast iron, they go straight to just searing up a steak or frying up some eggs. But my goal is to show you that there is so much more this thing is capable of. Now I've spent the last few weeks experimenting and really pushing my cast iron pan to its limits. And today I'm not only bringing you five incredibly delicious recipes, but also five really interesting techniques that you probably didn't even know were possible to pull off with your cast iron pan. Now the first one might be obvious. You might have even seen it on this channel, but this pan right here can crank out some incredible pizzas. But what's incredible, because of the shape of the pan, there are different forms of pizzas we can make, and that's where things get interesting. So the first type of pizza is more of a deep dish. Think Pizza Hut, where we'll be taking advantage of the lip of the cast iron to get some height on our crust. And we're gonna start with a 10 inch cast iron that's at room temperature. And I've got some dough balls already prepared. If you wanna dive deep into that world, my last video, which is below in the description, was a complete breakdown of every step of pizza making. And I'll give that cast iron a good hit of olive oil. And you don't wanna skimp on this because the last thing you want is dough sticking to your cast iron pan. Now I'm gonna lightly shape it to the pan with my hands. And then once that gluten starts resisting, just let it sit for another 10 minutes. And then it should be a lot easier to hit the edges of the pan. I'll go on with some homemade tomato sauce. And then I chopped up some fresh mozzarella cheese and I'll sprinkle that on top of the pizza. Uh, oops. All right, just a quick note. Every single cast iron recipe today will feature one key piece of produce from my garden. So right here, I've got these beautiful Italian style zucchinis. I'm not sure what the actual name is, but they are growing like crazy right now in my garden. What I like to do is use these almost like pepperoni. I mean, they don't taste anything like pepperoni, but they are round and they make a great pizza topping. So I'll slice them up, throw them all over the pizza, hit them with a little bit of olive oil just so they get nice and crispy and a little bit of salt. Hey, you know what? But maybe I'll hit it with the flour as well. I think I've seen the zucchini flowers used on pizza. Looks awesome. Look at that beauty. So this is off to the oven. I got it preheated at 550. I always keep an oven steel in my ovens to regulate the temperature. And I will set it for 10, just check it then. All right, it's been 10 minutes. I just wanna check in on it. Looks like we still need a little browning on the top there. Probably three more minutes. Let's see where we're at. I think we are done. Oh yeah, bubbly, bubbly hot mess. Oh, all right. I am definitely gonna just let that cool for about five minutes. Let's pray this thing comes out. Switching utensils. Yes. Oh, we got a little stickage. It's all right though. Gotta hit it with some fresh basil. Slice into this crispy guy. Oh boy. Look at the crust on that. That's what you get, that deep fried dough crust. Now, I would say the only thing I would change, I would have used a bigger dough ball, so it was just a little more deep dish. This is definitely a little bit thin. Mm. 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 Wow. When you bake dough in olive oil like that, it gets so crispy and the flavor is outstanding. Oh, so good. Wow, wow, wow. I wanna eat that all, but we have to make one more style of pizza, which if you do not have a pizza oven, cast iron is the best way to make Neapolitan pizza. All right, this one takes a little bit of technique, but it comes together quickly. I've got a 12 inch cast iron here on a high heat, just to give me a little extra room. And in the meantime, roll out some pizza. And just like Neapolitan style, you're protecting the air in that crust. Lock it in. All right, now I'm reading about 600, and you wanna make sure that's even. You want a nice, even temp. I'm gonna turn that off so it doesn't burn the bottom of the crust. Do my final pull on this into the pan. Oh, I don't have much sauce left. Hit it with the cheesy, little bit of basil, any hit of olive oil. See what's going on under there. Perfect. So we're just letting the residual heat cook the bottom of that pizza. It's coming along nice, looking great. You can see that beautiful puffy. And once that starts to puff and you're happy with the bottom, which I am, that's when we transfer away from here, I've got my broiler, which is this top heating element on a high heat, super important. We've cooked from direct heat from the bottom. Now we're cooking direct heat from the top. That will take probably three minutes. All right, let's see what's going on. Oh yeah. Whoa. Just wanna confirm the crust is cooked. Oh yeah. Perfect. See the bottom. Oh yes. I mean, near perfect bottom. Pretty damn sexy. Let's bring out the big boy. Slice, slice. Wow. Puffity Daniels right there. Probably too hot, probably too hot, but I'll do it anyway. Mm. 
Mm. I used to do this technique all the time in Brooklyn. My wife was obsessed. She still talks about it, even though I have fancy pizza ovens now. So the first technique is definitely easier. You get that super flavorful, crispy crust. But this is damn near perfect Neapolitan pizza. I'm not gonna lie to you. I fucked up the first one when I made it. I just didn't show you guys. Uh, okay, we're gonna do that one over again. This is my second shot at it and it's near perfect. One dish that is so specific to the cast iron that is also extremely underrated is the Dutch baby. I imagine a lot of you have never even tasted this dish, let alone try to make one at home, but I freaking love Dutch babies because basically it's a crepe batter, but rather than sitting there for 45 minutes making individual crepe, you just pour the whole damn thing in a cast iron pan and you get magic on the other end. So I'm gonna quickly whip up a batter in my blender here with only four ingredients. And the first ingredient, I did not grow, but my chickens did. Three eggs. Got a little shell in there. Come on, Joe. Oh. And it's super important that your eggs and your milk, which is the next ingredient, are at room temperature. I'm gonna do two thirds cup of whole milk, all purpose flour, pack in half a cup. Actually, this fourth ingredient is optional, but I'm just gonna sprinkle in a little bit of sugar to season, and then a little bit of salt. It's that freaking simple. We'll just slowly blend that together. There you go. Scrape down the sides real quick. One more blend. And done. All right, now just so you know, the batter should be very thin, like that. And what I'll do is just Get a cast iron, preheat that on a medium low heat, and get your oven preheated to 425 because this sucker's gonna puff up in there. Now, my one ingredient from the garden is asparagus. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but asparagus are actually perennial. And when you plant them the first year, you let them grow and fern out to really put all of that energy back into the roots so more asparagus come every single year. But I did happen to get some late asparagus, which was a nice little treat, and I decided to pick them. And I only have like five right here, <laughs> little ones. But that is all right. And I'll give Chef John full credit. I saw he did like an asparagus bacon Dutch baby and I got inspired. Now to cook this, we need something that can hold up to the heat. So I've got some ghee here, which is gonna be great flavor, but you can use oil. Go in with a nice chunk of that. You really wanna get a nice coating on the bottom. Fry up those asparagus real quick and then pour over the entire batter right into the middle. And you'll start to see pretty Pretty quickly after about 30 seconds, those sides starting to puff up around the edges. We got a big bubble right in the middle already forming. I'm gonna open this and just delicately transfer over this uncooked Dutch baby right into the oven at 425 for 20 minutes. Should be good. We're beeping. 20 minutes. Uh, ah, damn it. <laughs> Look at that. Now this will not stay like that. It just comes super inflated straight out of the oven. And then over time it deflates. Shut up! What I will do is hit it with a little bit of fresh lemon. Your crackle and fresh honey. I just love these things because you get this incredible crispy edge and then this chewy inside. And one of the best breakfast textures that I've tasted. Pop that out. Actually, that's not really deflating that much. Pretty epic. Let's give you a little slicey slicey. Now remember, there is no actual leavening agent in here. Just keep that. It's kind of like a popover, just made in a big old pan. Uh, what I love is the texture is extremely unique. Almost slightly chewy towards the center of the Dutch baby, and then very crispy and crunchy on the exterior. God damn. If I'm being honest, I didn't start making these until I started researching this video. It's quickly become one of my family's favorite breakfast items. And if you have guests staying over, this is a showstopper brunch right here. So while we're on the topic of cast iron, I figured I'd go over my favorite brands in the game. We've got a cast iron from Field Company, Kana, and Phoenix. Now up first, this beauty from Field Company is a pan I've been using for years. It's got more of a classic style look, but it's made right here in the US and the level of craftsmanship is incredible. Definitely a few notches above your entry level cast iron. And it comes actually unseasoned, but you can see right here, it's been very well seasoned just by using it over the last few years. If you're looking for something a little more stylish, this is the Milo from Kana, and it has a really nice modern design. It actually comes in eight different colors, so if you're looking for a pop of color in your kitchen, this is a great option. One of the big differences here is it's actually enamel coated. So rather than seasoning it like this, it comes ready to go right out of the box, which is nice because you'll never have to worry about rust or anything like that. And then finally, the absolute Mac Daddy over here. This pan is from Phoenix, and it's definitely the priciest of all three, but the build quality 
quality is out of control. I could do some bicep curls right now. These pants are all made in Portland, Oregon, and you can see there's some very unique design features. Rather than a circle, these eight sides make it easier to scoop something out like a cornbread or a frittata. And this spring coiled handle, just like a wood fire stove, gives you the ability to actually handle this cast iron when you're cooking rather than having to use a towel when it heats up. So if you're interested in one of these brands, click the link below in the description, head over to prohomecooks.com and browse our cast iron section. We are an official authorized retailer of all three of these brands. And again, if you treat these right, they will last you a lifetime and you will certainly get a whole lot out of them. Okay, up next is a chicken pot pie, which I was obsessed with back in the day. I used to take them down at Boston Market. And then as I grew up and learned how to cook, over time I realized you could make a pretty clean chicken pot pie that's not super heavy, that won't take you down. And the best way to do that by far is in the cast iron, which you will see why in just a second. So the first thing I'm gonna do is get a cast iron preheating on a medium heat, and then I'll start working on my aromatics. And I'm just using the basics here. I'll chop up some celery, some onion, and one carrot, all around the same size so they cook evenly. Now, when it comes to chicken pot pie, you really can use any piece of the chicken that can handle a longer cooking time. So just avoid chicken breasts, whatever you do. I broke down a whole chicken last night, and what I have right here are some chicken thighs with the bone out and the skin on. So what I'm gonna do is dry them off, season them up with some salt and pepper on both sides, get a little bit of oil in my pan, and start searing those off until they're nice and crispy. And in the meantime, this is a great time to bang out a pie crust. So this is around half a cup of cold butter that I'll just cut up in cubes. I'll add that to the food processor along with about two cups of all-purpose flour. And I'll start pulsing that up until the butter starts breaking down into the flour. All right, that's what you're looking for. The butter is nicely incorporated. Still some chunks in there. Not too smooth, that's what we want. Now here, we should be, yep, perfect. Building up all that flavor on the bottom of the pan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now we'll start streaming in a little bit of water to bring this across together. Check it. We just want it to really form together like that. Right on the cutting board. This is the world's fastest chicken pot pie. Gotta do what you gotta do. Ha, 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 ha. I'm gonna form it into a ring like this. Pop it into a bag. And we're gonna pop this in the refrigerator. Shabong. About 30 minutes. These. Hey, hey, hey. I'll explain these in a second. And these right here are definitely ready to go. Now we can and toss in our aromatics while that pie crust chills for about 30 minutes. One more thing. What do pie crust bake at? 375 sounds right. So I'll be cooking these aromatics down for about 10 minutes on a medium heat. And while they're cooking, I'll just chop up one clove of garlic and add that to the mix with the goal of really softening them up, but also building a ton of flavor to the base of our chicken pot pie. And while these are cooking, I'll work on the final ingredients to the pot pie. It is fresh, sweet corn season. So I'll just Take this corn right off the cob. Ah, boom. And don't think I forgot the fresh garden ingredient, which is here. I actually don't know what these are, if I'm being honest. Some type of white bean, obviously. I planted these a few months ago, and just recently they started to dry out. So I picked a bunch of them, and since they're fresh, they shouldn't take too long to cook. So beans and corn to really top it off. And now we're actually done here, so we can talk real. So I'll add a knob of butter, along with some salt to season, and when that's all melted and incorporated, I'll go in with a few tablespoons of flour. And this is gonna dry up really quick quickly, but the goal is to just keep stirring everything up in the pan so your flour toasts up, which will take around two to three minutes. Then I can start pouring in my milk little by little so you don't get any clumps and you get a nice creamy base. So you can already see the milk is really starting to thicken up. And what I like to do to lighten it up just a bit, this is a roasted chicken stock I made from a whole chicken that I butchered down to get these. And rather than doing like an entire cream base, I'll add in some stock and that will thicken up from the roux over time. Adds a ton of flavor. Now I can add these beans, corn, and I'll just cap that. Let everything cook together while the pie crust chills for about 15 more minutes. All right, check this out. Oh, how creamy that is. Wow. Power to the roux. I'm just gonna scissor up this chicken. Slice that in. Juices. Now these were remnants from the chicken stock I made. Not much flavor there, but good texture. Bulk it up a bit. Boom. Freaking incredible. High crust should be done. Hey. Oh yeah. Roll this out. 
Fucking good. Feeling it. I think my ratios were somehow magically on par here. That feels about right. Between an eighth and a quarter of an inch. Now the reason I love cast iron so much, we are making a one pot meal because of it. Trim off some, pleat it I guess. I don't know what I'm doing. Pleat, 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 feels right. Make a quick egg wash. Brush, 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 brush. Mike G, the pie baker right now. Can't forget a little. Slit, slit, ventilation hold. Feels about right, okay. All right, that's my signal. Oh my goodness. Hallelujah. I should probably put this on something. <gasps> I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be waiting to serve this, but it's just not gonna happen. Oh, that crust. It's insane. Get under there. Oh, dude, dude. That is one of the prettier sights I've seen. That freaking crust just came out so nice. Wow, flaky as all hell. Let me take a freaking picture of this real quick. Now the reason I love cast iron cooking, especially for something like this, do you think I have time to be making complete pie crust with the bottom and the top? No. And the truth is, the bottom of a pie crust, unless you're some master baker, usually sucks. What do you want with a pie crust? You want that crispy action, and it's all gonna get broken up anyway. Oh my God, oh my God. Cooked perfectly, I was a little nervous there. Mm. Watch this crispy. I just cannot get over this flakiness. Mm. Mm. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Bottom line with cooking, especially when you cook like me and you don't follow recipes, high risk shit here. And this freaking works. Wow. We're gonna finish things off with some dessert and I'm pretty pumped right now because this is one of the last weeks of fresh peaches at the farmer's market. Ah. These babies are just tender and perfect. And because we are trying to test the ultimate usage of the cast iron, I'm not just gonna bake a peach cake in here. I wanna show off what this thing can really do. So we're gonna make a peach turnover by first using direct heat to cook with the cast iron, then we make the cake and we actually bake with it. First thing I'm gonna do is preheat my oven at 300 degrees, and then I'll get my cast iron heating up on about a medium low heat, and I'm gonna go in with half a cup of granulated sugar to start to melt that down and caramelize it. Wow. Then I'm gonna take five kind of medium, smallish peaches. I'll slice those all in half, remove the core, and then I'll start cutting those up into smaller equal pieces so they stack nicely for the turnover. So after a few minutes on a medium heat, you can see the sugar starting to melt down. So I'll just continue to stir this. And once it turns into a caramel, that's when I'm gonna hit it with a few tablespoons of butter. Things are gonna bubble up a lot right here. So I'll just continue to stir it to make sure everything emulsifies and you get a nice creamy caramel. Wow, look at that. Just gonna turn the heat off on that. Make sure you got a nice even coat on the bottom of the pan. Start laying in these peaches in organized fashion. Boom. So you might be asking, what is from the garden? Well, I do have some peach trees doing great outside, but I won't get peaches till next year. But what I thought this cake really needed was just a floral hit. And I had a little bit of cilantro that went to seed, super dried out. So these are cilantro seeds or coriander seeds. And I'm just going to bash a few up in a mortar and pestle. Sprinkle them on the peaches for just a beautiful spicy floral touch. All right, live confessional. I'm a little bit nervous right now. Oh, I think I cooked the caramel maybe just a little too long. I got to like hard candy stage. Shit. So this is a cake recipe that I found actually from El Mundo Eats, which I've linked below in the description. And I like it because it could not be easier. I'm gonna start off with three eggs at room temperature, and then I'll add about a third of a cup of honey. And then I'll use my hand mixer to really whip this up, which is gonna take around five minutes. So it's gonna go through a bunch of transitions until it finally gets nice and frothy and holds its shape just a little better. Then I'll dump in one and a half cups of almond flour with just a little bit of salt and fold that in gently and just pour that over the peaches and then it's off to the oven. All right, praying to the heavens here. Got an oven at 300, pop that in there. Set it for 45 minutes. And we'll check back soon. All right, took about an hour. Look at that, perfectly browned. It's releasing from the edge. That's a good sign. It's like I should let it cool, then part of me doesn't wanna wait too long before it hardens again. Oh, it looks very juicy on the bottom. I'm gonna stick this thermometer in there to see if I can feel hardness at the bottom. I don't. I don't. I don't. I'm gonna give it three minutes and then we'll try to pop it out. All right, the time has come. It is all right in the universe. We'll see in a second. And <laughs> oh my God. It released. Oh God. Oh my God. 
Ah! Look how beautiful that looks! Let's cut into this beast. I just somehow made this and this, and it came out perfectly. Barely followed a recipe, but it worked. Just the simplicity of this, like without even tasting it, this is already one of my favorite cake recipes. Oh my God, that is so good. That's the best cake recipe ever. All of that caramel just like absorb into this cake layer right there. And then the peaches just turn into jam. I'm gonna try to refrain from eating half of this right now. All right, cast iron. The goal was to take this thing into another dimension and I would say mission accomplished. Make sure you check out prohomecooks.com to shop the best cast iron brands in the game and comment in below with what other kitchen tools you wanna see in this series.